Thank you. I'm so excited to be with you guys this morning. Normally, I do talk on technology topics, and I love technology. I'm kind of an Apple fanboy. Anybody else out there? Yeah. I've got more devices in my family than I've got people, which is increasingly becoming true, I think. But I was thinking last week, as I had this opportunity to speak to you, what do I wish that someone had told me when I was a college student? And it's this, change your story, change your life. I was 29 years old, had just moved to Nashville, Tennessee, and I'd become the vice president of marketing for Thomas Nelson. It was like at that point the pinnacle of success for me. I was so excited about this job. There was only one slight problem. I was scared to death. I knew I was playing over my head, out of my league, and I thought it was just a matter of time before everyone else figured out that they'd made a horrible mistake. Now this sense of being overwhelmed, of being unqualified and inadequate, manifests itself in my body in two very embarrassing ways. Number one, I sweat profusely. And number two is that when I would um, go to the office, when I would be in public meetings, my hands would be ice cold. And, and so when I would go to an important meeting, I would often put on, and again, this is kind of embarrassing even to admit it now, I would put on two t-shirts under my regular shirt, hoping that I wouldn't sweat through and anyone could see. And I would strategically select my clothing for the colors that were the least likely to show perspiration. And then I would go into the restroom before an important meeting and I would uh, rub my hands vigorously under the hot water, hoping to warm them up so that I didn't give myself away and let people know that I was as nervous and as ungrounded as I felt. A few years into this, I realized that the problem was not with my body. The problem was in my head. It was the story I was telling myself, and it was a bad story. You know, in life, there are always those things that happen to us, and then there's the story, the interpretation that we layer on top of that and explain to ourselves what it means for us. And, and so let me just read to you the story that I was, was telling myself because I actually wrote this down. I, the story I was saying to myself inside, I was saying, you are too young for this job. Worse, you don't have the experience. Who do you think you're fooling? It's just a matter of time before everyone in the company sees it. And then you're going to be out on the street right where you belonged all along. I think almost every bad experience, every issue or problem that we're facing can be traced back to these bad stories that rattle around in our heads. And sometimes we're completely unaware of what's happening. Let me give you a few examples. I have a good friend. I'll call him Bill. That's not his real name, but let's call him Bill. He lost his job in the recession. Now, this is a guy with a couple of advanced degrees, very articulate, very good looking, but who has been out of work for almost four years. Now, first of all, that has to be a horrible experience, right? I mean, to lose your job, to not feel like you can find one, and to provide for your family. But I noticed that when I was with him, he was increasingly telling himself a story that wasn't true. But it was the meaning that he was layering on top of his experience. It was a fact that he'd lost his job. But he started telling himself this story. No one will hire me, I'm too old. Especially when they can hire someone younger for less money. It was a bad story. It was a lie. How many of you know 
people that are older, that are energetic, vivacious, can take on a mountain. I mean, I know lots of people like that. And sometimes we know young people that are lethargic and can't seem to have a, a lot of energy. You know, the fact is that age has nothing to do with our energy level, but it does if you're telling yourself that story. Thankfully, he got a job last week. I just talked to him. But he started telling himself a better story. And I'll come back to that in a minute. I have another friend. I'm going to call her Jennifer. Jennifer was abandoned by her father. Just, it was just her mother and her when she was very young. And I, I can't even imagine or begin to fathom what that would be like. That was a fact. But over time, she began to layer this story on top of those facts and created a narrative that wasn't true. And here's how it went for her in her head. Every time I get close to someone, they leave. And that affected her dating relationships. It affected her relationships with her friends because she started to believe it and would inevitably fulfill the story even when it wouldn't have come true otherwise. She was living a bad story, a lie, and it had a direct impact on her life. Well, let me give you a couple of biblical examples because I know it's easy to think, uh, okay, yeah, but what does the Bible have to say? That's interesting, I can sort of see that. But you know the Bible is full of these same kind of stories as well. Do you remember that the children of Israel had slipped into such wickedness that God delivered them to the Babylonians for about 70 years? And during this time, he raised up this young man. One commentary uh, that I read said that Jeremiah was about 17 when he was called of God. And interestingly, here's, here's the call in chapter 1 of Jeremiah, verses 4 through 8. God says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. This is a fact. This is the truth. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Now imagine that. A 17-year-old young boy being called to be not just a prophet to the children of Israel, but to the world. And here's what Jeremiah says. Ah, Lord God. Behold, I cannot speak, for I am a youth. You know, who's going to listen to me? My age is an issue. You must have made a mistake. It couldn't be me. Here's what God says to him. I don't know how it could be more direct. He says, do not say, I am a youth. For you shall go to all whom I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. If you're here this morning and you're telling yourself you're too young to do something significant for God, that's a bad story. It's really a lie. Because the truth is you are exactly as old as you need to be to fulfill God's calling in your life. God doesn't make mistakes. Another example from Scripture. You remember the story of Jacob? He had a lot of bad stories that were rattling around in his head. But you remember he had uh, kind of outfoxed his brother Esau. He had bought his birthright for a bowl of stew, stew basically. And he had stolen his elder brother's blessing from their father. Well, Esau wasn't happy about it. And Esau, in fact, almost immediately after it happened, he started plotting Jacob's murder. Jacob wasn't dumb, he got wind of this, and he fled to his uncle Laban. Now, you remember the story when he was working for his uncle Laban, that he fell in love with Rachel. And he worked for seven years to earn her hand in marriage. His uncle pulled a trick on him, gave him his sis the sister Leah, and then he had to work another seven years for Rachel. And then another six years for the flocks and the property that he got. So 20 years after this incident with Esau. 
And Jacob thinks he's had enough. He's going to go back home. He's going to go to Canaan. But he realizes on the trip to Canaan that he's got to pass through Edom where his brother Esau lives. And in his mind, he's still back there 20 years ago when Esau was ticked off at him and was thinking revenge. And so Jacob decides to take his entire family and all of his possessions and divide them into two different companies. This is in Genesis 32 and 33. And he's thinking to himself, I'll send the first company ahead with a lot of gifts and try to appease my brother Esau. And if my brother destroys them, then at least the second group, which he happened to be in, he would escape. And so he sends some messengers out to his brother to kind of take the temperature and find out how angry his brother might be. Now what's, what's really interesting is the messengers came back and they said, Esau's on his way with 400 men. Jacob panics. In his heart, this can't be good. It's got to be an army. They're going to destroy him and all that he loves and all that he has. And you know what happens when their eyes lock? Jacob and Esau, now the first time in 20 years, they see each other from a distance. What happens? I love this. Genesis 33, 4. But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. Totally different than the story that Esau or that Jacob had been telling to himself. Because why? People change. And maybe you're telling yourself a story that they're out to get you or he's out to get you or she's out to get you and you're not allowing room for the fact that God is at work in those people's lives as well. And he can change their hearts as well. By the way, Esau was also confused. He didn't know why this group showed up with this vast array of gifts. And so Esau says to his brother Jacob when he sees him, he says, what do you mean by all this company which I met? And Jacob says, these are to find favor in the sight of my Lord. And Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. He wasn't thinking revenge. Something had happened in his heart and he had changed. What about you? What about those people that you think are out to get you? Is that the truth? Or is it simply a story that you keep repeating to yourself? It may be different than you think. Another example, Moses. I saved the best one for last, the best example. The thing about Moses, by the way, interestingly, um, he was 80 years old when this happened. So 80 years old and he has this experience at the burning bush where God calls him to deliver the children of Israel from the hand of the Egyptians. 80 years old. I mean, I, I know so many people that are at that age that are basically retired, checked out, given up. They're done. They're just coasting into the finish line. Not Moses, not people like Caleb, but when God calls Moses, to say he was reluctant would be an understatement. First, when God speaks to him, Moses complains. He says, I am a nobody. And God says, come now therefore and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people and the children of Israel out of Egypt. This is in Exodus chapter 3. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? So God said, I will certainly be with you. Maybe this morning you're feeling like I'm a nobody. I can't fulfill God's call in my life because I'm a no one. God says that he plus you are sufficient. He alone is sufficient. But Moses doesn't take that at face value. He offers up another complaint. So Moses says, but suppose they will not believe me or listen to my vo voice. Suppose they say, 
the Lord has not appeared to you. In other words, he doesn't have credibility. And God makes it possible for him to perform these signs and wonders and astound the Egyptians. But Moses is still not satisfied. And this is the best part of all. Moses says to the Lord, Oh my Lord, I am not eloquent. Neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. He felt completely and utterly inadequate to the task. But notice what God says. The Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth, or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seen, or the blind? Have not I, the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be your mouth and teach you what you shall say. If God has a call on your life to speak or to write, he will supply what you need to fulfill it. Our biggest challenge is not the acquisition of the skills that we need, though that's important. It's the courage to obey God in the moment and do what he says regardless of how, in, how adequate that we may feel. But even that's not enough for Moses. Unbelievably, he comes back to him. And finally, Moses says, you know, he, he can't get off the hook because he doesn't have any credibility or he feels like a nobody or he doesn't have the skills. So what does Moses say? This is literally in the text. Exodus 4.13. Send someone else. And the very next verse says, so the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. The grace and mercy of God is that he didn't destroy Moses right there, but he worked with him. And he provided in the person of Aaron, Moses' brother, a spokesperson. But I could go on and on, but you get the idea. People have these bad stories, things that aren't even truth, but they feel like the truth because there's a narrator inside of their head that keeps telling these stories over and over again until they believe them. What's rattling around in your head this morning? Maybe it's about your own adequacy, your own skills, your abilities, what you can do or what you can accomplish, your experience, your heritage, whatever it is. By the way, if you feel all that, congratulations, you're normal. You know, the people that don't feel that way tend to end up narcissists. But if you feel that way, it's actually a good sign, but it shouldn't be an obstacle that keeps you from succeeding. The cool thing is that you don't have to be the victim of these stories. We can take control of this narrative by deconstructing it and replacing it with the truth. And what I want to give you this morning is five steps, five ways to do that. Okay, number one, recognize the voice in your head. There's a narrator that lives between your ears that sounds like you, that even speaks in the first person. I don't know if it's the world, the flesh, or the devil. It doesn't matter. It has the same impact, and that is it gets you to believe a lie, a story that's not true because it focuses on the wrong elements of the story. It magnifies the wrong things. It minimizes the right things, and it creates an entire narrative, a concoction really, that keeps you stuck. So you've got to recognize there's a voice going on in your head. Some of you can probably hear it right now. I could hear it right before I came up to speak. Step number two, jot down, literally do this in a journal, not right now, but later, jot it down in a journal what the voice is saying. It may be simple things like this. I'm too young. Or I'm too old. Or I'm not that well educated. Or I'm not very smart. Or I'm overeducated. Or I don't have enough experience. Or like my friend, I have too much experience. Or I can't write, or I always quit. Or I can't quit that behavior. Or I'm not creative, or I'll eventually fail, or I'm not good with money. Is that the truth? 
Or is that just a story you're telling yourself? And I'm going to tell you the clue is that it's key, if it's keeping you stuck and keeping you from doing something that you know, someplace deep in your heart, you were called to do, that you were made for, it's a bad story. And it can change. But you've got to become aware of the narrator. That's step number one. And then step number two, jot down what the narrator is saying. Step number three, evaluate whether or not the story is empowering. There are some stories, thankfully, maybe because you had a coach that believed in you or a parent that really believed in you, or someone somewhere that helps you formulate a better story, some of those stories could really be empowering. And you need to keep telling yourself those stories. But evaluate, be discerning. I think one of the great things about being human is that we have the privilege of not just reacting to life, but pushing the pause button and putting what Dr. Covey called a space between the stimulus and the response so that we can evaluate. Are these thoughts that I'm thinking empowering me or are they disempowering me? Are they moving me forward or keeping me stuck? Are they enabling me to fulfill God's call in my life or are they keeping me from being obedient to what I know in my heart he's called me to be and to do? Step number four is write down a different story. This is the fun part of it. I talk a, a lot about this in a little ebook that I, I wrote that you can get for free on my site, site called Creating Your Personal Life Plan. And you can find that at michaelhyatt.com. But I talk about in every area of your life becoming almost like a, um, a, a screenplay writer where you write a better story for your life. And in this particular area where you find yourself disempowered, stuck, Write down a different story. Literally write it down. It only has to be a paragraph, but write it down. I'm going to give you an example here in this next step. Step number five, tell yourself the new story. Remember when I was talking about when I was 29 years old and I felt so inadequate and I had these embarrassing physical problems? Here's the story that I wrote down, realizing that it wasn't a problem with my body. It was a problem inside of my head. So I wrote down this story. Yes, you are young. That gives you tremendous energy. Trust me, you'll get to the place where you appreciate this. And then I said, you also don't have a lot of experience, which is why it's easier for you to think outside of the box. God has provided everything you need to be successful in this situation. Even if you fail, you'll learn something. You can't lose you can only quit, and you are most certainly not a quitter. Different story, different result. It didn't change everything overnight, but gradually, as I repeated that story, it had an impact on my physiology. Initially, when you start telling yourself a new story, it's like wearing a coat that's too big. It just doesn't quite fit. It feels a little awkward, doesn't feel comfortable. It feels like it's borrowed, not owned, but you have to step into it. And repeating the truth, repeating a true interpretation or a more empowering interpretation of what's happened takes time. But you can grow into it. We don't have to be the victim of these bad stories. What about you? Are these stories controlling you in ways that are not healthy, in ways that aren't moving you forward? You can choose. Let me tell you one more story, and I'll finish with this. Uh, we've had really wonky weather in Nashville, Tennessee, where I live. How, has it been that way in Lynchburg? You know, up and down, cold and hot. So last Monday, a week ago today, it was like 70 degrees, which was unbelievable. But that uh, night, a cold front blew in, and the temperature plummeted about 40 degrees. So early Tuesday morning... At 2.45 in the morning, my wife and I woke up to a start because the tornado sirens were going off, which is kind of a, an alarming thing to be awoken out of a dead sleep with that kind of sound. So 
we went to the den, turned the TV on, sat down and watched the weather. And honestly, we've been through this drill before and nothing happened. It's mostly theater. So we weren't really paying that much attention. So I got a little bored watching the weather, but felt obligated to watch it just in case. I walked to the window, and the wind was blowing pretty hard, but the rain was blowing completely sideways, horizontal to the ground. I'm thinking to myself, that can't be good. And so I went back into the den, sat down, I told Gail, my wife, about this, and then all of a sudden we heard the wind pick up and it got unbelievably loud, like a freight train or a jet engine. And we both just looked at each other, stood straight up out of our seats, and ran for the basement. And we had no sooner gotten to the bottom stair than we heard this giant, huge crash. And then we heard this twisting of metal that sounded like uh, the world's biggest cat having a really bad labor. And, and it probably didn't last more than about 30 seconds. And then everything got quiet, just completely quiet. So we kept looking at each other. We stayed in the basement for a couple of more minutes. I mean, this whole thing didn't last more than five minutes. We came out of the basement. We walked to the side of our house where we have kind of a side porch. We live in an old Victorian home that's over 100 years old, and it has a portico and we saw this mountain of rubble. Evidently, a tornado had just hit the top of our house and our neighbors, took our chimney down, it fell on the portico that had all this copper roofing on it, which was now all twisted up on the ground. And there was this huge mess. So we inspected the rest of the house, no other damage, that's all that we could see. So we went to bed, the next morning we got up, it was actually worse than we thought, part of our fence was taken out. So we're still waiting on the insurance adjuster uh, to come out, but I got a contractor to come out and clean up the mess because we couldn't even get our cars out of the driveway. So the contractor says to me, he said, look, this isn't a firm estimate, but I think this is probably $100,000 worth of damage. I mean, I gasp. My first house didn't cost close to that. And to have that much damage, I couldn't believe it. Okay, now listen to me. There's two kinds of stories that I could have told about these facts. I could have said, why does bad stuff like this always happen to me? At the worst possible time, I'm about to go out of town. I'm going to be leaving my wife with this mess. Why does this kind of stuff happen? And it's so expensive. And what if the insurance doesn't cover it? That would not have been a story that would have been helpful, would it? And all it is is a meaning that's made up on top of the facts. Let me tell you what I did tell myself. Thank God no one was hurt. This is only stuff. It's all going to go away eventually anyway. Not even a window was broken. It happened in a part of the house that's not that important. It's going to be okay. And I can use this story in Lynchburg this next week. <laughs> so it all comes down to what kind of story are you creating? Are you doing this consciously and intentionally? Or are you just letting this narrator take control and selling you something that's not true and keeping you stuck? What is it for you today? What is it that you've been telling yourself, maybe for years, maybe for decades? And it's time to stop the madness. It's time to take control of that and say, look, that is not getting me where I want to go. I'm going to reconstruct that story based on God's truth and tell myself a different story. Like the song said that we started with, nothing is wasted. Everything that God puts into our life, God works everything together for good to those who love him and to those who are called according to his purpose. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for everything that happens in our life. Lord, knowing that 
while others may mean it for evil, you mean it for good to accomplish our sanctification, our growth. And Father, we pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear and help us to interpret the things that happen to us from your perspective, to see that you're a loving God who is working these things together for our good. Help us to step out of our small stories and step into the big story that is your redemption for the world. We'll give you the praise and the glory and the honor. Amen.